In August of 1977, a Soviet test pilot did something that still haunts aerospace engineers today. He strapped himself into a twin-engine MiG-25 Foxbat, fired up the afterburners, and climbed straight up into the thin air above Kazakhstan. When he finally leveled off, his altimeter read, 37 kilometers, a record that remains unbroken nearly 50 years later. To put that in perspective, he was flying higher than three Mount Everests stacked on top of each other, so high that the sky around him had turned completely black and he could see the curvature of Earth like an astronaut. But here's what makes this achievement truly remarkable. He did it in a machine that was essentially a flying brick with engines, using technology that would be considered primitive by today's standards. So why, with all our modern engineering marvels, hasn't anyone broken this record? Why can't our $150 million F-22 Raptors or F-35 Lightning IIs climb higher than a 1960s Soviet interceptor? The answer reveals a fundamental ceiling that has trapped fighter aviation for decades, an invisible barrier where the laws of physics themselves say, game over. But here's the twist. Some experimental aircraft have found ways to cheat this system entirely, reaching altitudes that blur the line between aviation and spaceflight. That 1977 record wasn't just about one brave pilot pushing the envelope, it was the climax of a decade-long altitude war between superpowers. Think of it like a deadly game of aerial leapfrog, where national pride hung in the balance like humanity's last stand against the titans. Except the enemy was physics itself. The Americans had thrown the first punch. The MiG-25 that set the ultimate record had actually been designed in response to fears about American supersonic bombers and spy planes. Soviet engineers built the Foxbat to be an interceptor that could catch anything the Americans threw at them, no matter how high or fast it flew. But the Americans weren't about to let the Soviets claim the Sky Islands. This was their grand line to conquer. In a furious two-week period during January and February 1975, the F-15 Eagle systematically destroyed eight time-to-climb records previously held by the MiG-25. Picture this, an F-15 screaming from ground level to 30 kilometers in just three minutes and 27.8 seconds. That's like riding a controlled explosion straight up through the atmosphere. He basically went super cyan. The aircraft then coasted on pure momentum to nearly 32 kilometers before physics finally forced it back down. The Soviets couldn't let this stand. By 1986, their Su-27 flanker had reclaimed all eight of those records, proving that the altitude wars were far from over. Each of these record flights required aircraft stripped down to their absolute minimum weight, no weapons, minimal fuel, everything sacrificed for the ability to touch the edge of space. But here's what's fascinating. These weren't just bragging rights. These altitude capabilities translated directly into military advantage. The ability to launch anti-satellite missiles and intercept high-flying reconnaissance aircraft that other nations couldn't even reach. To understand why these records matter and why they're so hard to break, you need to think of Earth's atmosphere like a treacherous staircase where each step up makes breathing exponentially harder. Commercial airliners operate on the bottom steps, cruising comfortably at 10 to 15 kilometers in the troposphere where there's still plenty of air to keep their engines running efficiently but fighter jets are designed to climb the staircase much higher into the stratosphere and beyond, where the air becomes so thin that survival itself becomes a challenge. The MiG-25's record-setting flight took it well into the stratosphere, where temperatures can drop to minus 56 degrees Celsius, and the air pressure is less than 1% of what we experience at sea level. At that altitude, 
an unprotected human would lose consciousness in seconds, and due to the near total absence of atmospheric pressure, their blood would literally start boiling at body temperature. This phenomenon, known as the Armstrong Limit, occurs at around 19 kilometers. The Soviet pilot who set the 37 kilometer record was flying nearly twice as high as the point where human biology simply stops working without a pressure suit. He was essentially a test pilot riding a missile through an environment more hostile than the surface of Mars. But even with protective equipment and extraordinary courage, these record flights revealed a fundamental truth. There's a hard ceiling beyond which conventional fighter jets simply cannot operate. The enemy isn't altitude itself, it's the physics of how jet engines work. Here's the brutal reality that every aerospace engineer knows. Beyond 18 to 21 kilometers, jet engines start suffocating. They're essentially giant vacuum cleaners that suck in air, mix it with fuel, compress it, ignite it, and expel the expanding gases to create thrust. But as you climb higher, the air gets exponentially thinner. At sea level, each cubic meter of air contains about 1.2 kilograms of oxygen-rich molecules, plenty to feed a hungry jet engine. By 15 kilometers, that drops to just 0.09 kilograms. At the altitude where those record-setting flights took place, you're dealing with 0.003 kilograms per cubic meter. In simple words, it's like trying to run an ultra-marathon while breathing through a cocktail straw that gets progressively smaller. The F-22 Raptor, despite being the most advanced fighter ever built, has a service ceiling of around 19.8 kilometers, nearly 18 kilometers lower than the MiG-25's record. This isn't because American engineers are less capable, it's because modern fighters are designed for practical combat operations, not record-setting stunts that push aircraft beyond their operational limits. Even more limiting is what happens to control surfaces at extreme altitude. Fighter jets rely on rudders, elevators, and ailerons that work by deflecting airflow. In the whisper-thin air above 24 kilometers, these control surfaces become about as effective as trying to steer a car by waving a paddle outside the window. Pilots lose the ability to maneuver, making the aircraft essentially uncontrollable. So if conventional jet engines hit an insurmountable wall around 21 kilometers, how did the X-15 manage to reach 107 kilometers between 1959 and 1968? Simple. It cheated. The X-15 wasn't really a fighter jet, it was a manned missile with wings. Instead of relying on air-breathing engines, it used rocket propulsion that carried its own oxygen supply. The aircraft had to be carried up to 14 kilometers by a B-52 bomber before being dropped like a bomb, at which point the pilot would light the rocket engine and essentially ride a controlled explosion to the edge of space. At its peak, altitude of 107 kilometers, the X-15 had officially crossed the Karman line, widely recognized as the boundary of space, higher even than many satellites operate. But this came at a cost. The aircraft could only operate for minutes at a time, required massive ground support, and was essentially a one-way ticket to the edge of the atmosphere with just enough fuel to get back down safely. The X-15 proved that aircraft could reach space, but only by abandoning the fundamental principles that makes a fighter jet a fighter jet. You can't deploy a fleet of rocket-powered interceptors that need to be carried aloft by bomber aircraft and can only operate for a few minutes at a time. Today's operational fighter jets represent a practical compromise between altitude capability and real-world utility. 
The F-35 Lightning tops out around 15 kilometers, the Eurofighter Typhoon reaches about 19 kilometers, and even Russia's newest Su-57 can't break the 21 kilometer barrier during normal operations. This isn't a failure of modern engineering, it's a recognition that the altitude wars of the 1970s and 1980s were largely meaningless for actual combat. Modern air-to-air -air engagements happen at much lower altitudes where maneuverability and situational awareness matter more than the ability to climb to the edge of space. Surface-to-air missiles can reach well above 30 kilometers anyway, so hiding in the thin air isn't the defensive advantage it once seemed to be, but the quest for higher flying aircraft hasn't ended, it's evolved. The focus has shifted from conventional fighters to specialized platforms that can operate in the gray zone between atmosphere and space. The future of high altitude flight lies not in pushing conventional jet engines beyond their limits, but in developing hybrid propulsion systems that can operate across the entire altitude spectrum. Enter scramjet technology, engines that could theoretically operate up to 76 kilometers. Unlike conventional jets that compress incoming air before mixing it with fuel, scramjets allow air to flow through the the engine at supersonic speeds. This technology could enable aircraft to transition seamlessly from air breathing flight in the lower atmosphere to near rocket performance at extreme altitudes. For context, 76 kilometers is still 24 kilometers below, where space officially begins at 100 kilometers, but it represents a quantum leap beyond anything flying today. Companies like Reaction Engines are developing the SABRE engine, which can breathe air like a conventional jet at lower altitudes, but switch to rocket mode when the air becomes too thin. This hybrid approach could finally break the invisible ceiling that has trapped fighter aviation since the 1970s. Imagine fighters that could operate anywhere from sea level to the edge of space, transitioning between different propulsion modes as needed. These wouldn't be the stripped down record-setting aircraft of the Cold War era, but fully operational weapon systems capable of sustained high-altitude flight. Altitude is back on the menu and is getting extremely important because as we are witnessing the modern warfare in Russia-Ukraine war, where drones, satellites, internet are the backbone and the deciding factor. I would not be surprised if next generation fighter jets are designed as an addition to target satellites that provide internet to the enemy on the battlefield. The 37 kilometer record set by that Soviet pilot in 1977 still stands not because we lack the technology to break it, but because we've learned that conventional jet engines hit an absolute wall where physics simply says, no more. That ceiling exists somewhere around 21 to 24 kilometers for operational aircraft, and pushing beyond it requires abandoning the fundamental principles that make fighter jets practical weapons, but we're standing on the edge of a revolution. The next generation of high altitude aircraft won't be limited by the need to breathe air or the constraints of conventional propulsion. They'll be hybrid spacecraft fighters that treat the atmosphere like a highway to space rather than a prison with an invisible ceiling. So here's my question for you. Should the next generation of fighters be designed to operate in space? to shoot at satellites as well? Or is the traditional atmospheric battleground still where the real action happens? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. It took hundreds of hours to research, animate, and produce this piece, so please hit that like button and subscribe for more deep dives and support this channel in the membership or in the Patreon.